uh, of public input and public values. And so um, the government can either, um, as, as, as Laura went through, um, the government can uh, regulate, uh, the government can, um, can uh, the government can uh, um, actually produce things. Can actually use its its power to, to to produce. It can it can use its power to regulate and create laws. It can also procure. And it isn't a question of uh, of what particular things it, it chooses, but 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 laying out those rules. And and so, is it is what we're talking about the procurement of open source software or a particular format? And, and this is something that is still to be worked out, um, I think, here. Um, the, question, the question is whether or not um, there, will, there will be a, a public input um, into that process, whether or not there will be a, an opportunity for the multi-stakeholderism, um, which is promoted by the IGF, and something that the Dynamic Coalition can input into um, that would, uh, that would promote that kind of thing. So why why are we choosing uh, several questions uh, uh, should be uh, put to the fore? Why are we focusing first on documents? Um, why are we focusing on the procurement power of governments? And I think it, I think um, uh, on both those questions, um, the right choices have been made um, in, uh, in, in, in focusing on this uh, as a matter of procurement as opposed to um, uh, regulation and production. Um, it really is that uh, laying out of, of, of um, uh, accountability, uh, not by relaying particular rules, but by opening up the process um, for there to be uh, many inputs um, and and competition among uh, vendors and uh, transparency in a process and transparency in the production and, and for that reason um, focusing in on the procurement role of uh, of governments is something that is a valuable thing that the dynamic coalition is pushing for and something that actually seems to be a feasible goal um, in terms of advocacy uh, to be done here in terms of documents um, these are distinguishable from other kinds of products uh, the government um, uh, buys all sorts of things uh, all the time. Uh, but documents, I think, occupy a special place in that they're not just um, things that are bought and sold in terms of products, but they're a form of communication. Um, they are uh, a way for people to uh, exchange information, preserve information, um, uh, manipulate information, and uh, this is uh, a category of the way in which we interact with each other that uh, the government um, does have a role in preserving um, its public nature. So um, uh, for that reason, um, uh, the, the open standard um, is, 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 is to be pursued. Now, as a matter of open, uh, uh, open source software, um, I, think it's, uh, I think the case can be, uh, can be made uh, that open source software is not a product, um, although we associate open source with a particular product. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much done. So um, uh, that, that open source, uh, we should remember, is not a particular product, although within, um, within the um, document space at the current um, moment in time, um, it is associated with a particular vendor um, uh, 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 by, by, by some. I think it's important to recognize that open source uh, uh, refers to um, a process, uh, a means by which um, uh, 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 information products are produced, and therefore um, we can we can. We can, it is consistent with the role of government to enable that kind of uh, process to be opened up both for economic and democratic reasons. Um, and so uh, we should raise the questions um, of what the Dynamic Coalition should focus on. Um, and I think we can affirm um, the current focus and try to pursue uh, 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 a common document that we can bring to governments and uh, enable technologists and businesses and the public to participate in that process as well. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Aidan. And uh, one thing you mentioned that I thought was interesting for this audience to consider is that a lot of standard setting processes are done outside of government purview. And 
uh, you know, my organization, for example, has repeatedly asked the uh, Standing Committee of, on the Law of Patents at WIPO to consider a role, if any, for the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, to have some sort of uh, global mechanisms for disclosure. But now I think there's a lot of uh, food for thought, and uh, so we'll take questions from the floor. Yeah. Uh, Sunil Abraham from the Center for Internet and Society. Uh, I just wanted to clarify on the link between open source and open standards. Open source is the test for whether a standard is truly an open source, uh, open standard. And Simon Phipps uh, from Sun Microsystem has characterized this very beautifully in his canary in the coal mine analogy. So if open source dies, then it's not an open standard. And uh, in the political context, especially in developing countries, uh, RAND and any IP claims related to open standards is the last ditch attempt by proprietary software vendors and their lobbies to block the global adoption of free and open source software. So we should understand uh, the context in which we are operating. So I would uh, discourage KEI from coming up with any new definitions of open standards because there we have far too many definitions. We must strengthen the existing definitions which uh, pr protect free and open source software. So this is uh, the reality and uh, the theory may be fine but we are also dealing with a political and economic reality in uh, developing countries. Thank you. Hello, um, Max Sengers from uh, the Internet Bill of Rights Coalition. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you to the work that you're doing. I think it's great that there's uh, concrete outcomes and documents and um, results in, in that coalition. Um, I would like to uh, raise a cautious question um, as um, you have been raising. Um, the IGF is still um, developing its concrete um, mandate and where it is influencing policy making. I'm not, a hundred, I mean, I hear your case, how it is related to um, internet governance. I'm not 100% uh, sure that it is um, right on spot with um, the governance of the internet, um, the work that you're doing. But um, still, I, I hope you continue it, and um, I think it's very good work. Why is it not directly related to, um, well, because the, um, the procurement of governments um, is not really, I just don't see a direct connection to how the internet is, is governed, to the in different bodies that are um, uh, regulating technical and social aspects of um, the internet. Um, in this context, um, I would like to ask the um, coalition whether they would be interested to explore another route of um, open standards, and that is um, the Internet Bill of Rights is um, talking to the privacy coalition to look into the development of open standards for privacy. Um, so what we're thinking about is in terms of um, standardizing the um, um, service level agreements, the, the service agreements when you sign up to Facebook, when you sign up to uh, different services, to have a standardization and an open standard, of course, would be um, the way to go um, in that direction. So uh, I'd like the DC to consider that. Hello. Well, I can talk loud enough. Uh, Morgan Reed from the Association for Competitive Technology. Um, I was interested in um, Theodore's presentation, and I thought uh, the one thing that caught me up, and I, I guess I would disagree with you a little bit on the document formats, the war is over in the sense that Microsoft agreed to, to use ODF and, in fact, make it a default. So I, I, think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a very squishy process to try to continue to push ODF and the goals of ODF if the goal underlying the goal is to uh, is to replace Microsoft software because they've shown and and because of Neely Crows and other events have shown a willingness to do just about anything that is necessary in order to meet those goals. What I thought was interesting about the presentation and moving it forward from the, the backward looking battle is you brought up video cards and uh, and this goes to the other thing that we are really seeing in document in the document retention space for governments is that most of the key documents that governments have aren't in document formats at all. They're actually in large warehouse databases in siloed systems that are on mainframes. 
And for the vast majority of those mainframes, they exist in an amazing number of proprietary COM formats that prevent uh, uh, Intel-based machines from taking over the role that exists. In fact, there's essentially one vendor in the mainframe space, and they prevent the resale of used mainframes, even. So I think that building on what you, what you presented in the video card space and the, and the mobile phone space, I'd look down at uh, point four when it comes to the document uh, archiving and retention by governments and say that the area that really needs to be pushed looking forward is how do governments store our medical records, how do governments store our, our driving records, because I think most national CIOs and state CIOs from governments, if you talk to them, they'll find that a huge document pool, and, and let's, let's be realistic, database formats are still documents, that's, that's where the hardest knob is to crack. That's where you have the hardest vendor lock-in. You've got almost an impossible mountain to climb. And so to do a forward-looking KEI document, I think you need to address the mainframe issue um, beyond ODF, because I think Microsoft's proven they're willing to do whatever is necessary to support ODF. Thanks, uh, Bob Jolliffe. I'll be with the Shuttleworth Foundation. Um, do you want me to stand up? <laughs> First of all, I, I'd like to really f fully endorse everything I've heard from Morgan. I think it, I think it's 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 really refreshing that. I didn't think we'd be agreeing on this stuff, but we are. I'd like to raise a, a little bit of caution, maybe about about the the future of Microsoft support for ODF, because that for me I think is absolutely critical. I really welcome the 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 inclusion of Microsoft into the ODF fold. I sit on the ODF technical committee, and I see Microsoft joined us five six months ago. They've been part of it. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing support. I think for ODF version 1.1 in in. Uh, Microsoft's uh, next service service pack due due, due next year, um, and I also I, I fully agree that the, the the next challenge really is in the main space main mainframe space. Um, I think at the moment what we've seen in order to be able to and for us certainly for coming from South Africa, it's been an, uh, the, the 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 focus on open standards has been very much an enabler to enable us to be able to pursue the open source policy that we try to pursue, and I think. Similar experiences there from Brazil. Um, the desktop has been a, a, a real challenge because of the document format problem. I think if we've solved the document format problem, you're absolutely right. Attention will now be diverted to um, what kind of formats are being used, not just to store the information, but in order to be able to interact with it. Is it working? Is yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I'd just like to address our Brazilian um, speaker today because you made a very important point about a cultural change. And at the transition phase, people used to using, for instance, Word and Microsoft-related products, then the government tells them to use another format. I think we underestimate that form of sort of passive habit and resistance. And... Um, it's sort of the under the underground part of this whole process, which is focusing on technical issues. Could you tell us a bit more about some of the tactics when users resist or refuse? Um, because um, we really underestimate this level in the execution of all these hopes and dreams from a technical point of view. I think it's very important for us to appreciate that when we are using the term open standards, it has a much wider ambit than just software. And uh, so, for example, open standards could be in the realm of networking on a whole lot of issues, aspects of, within the ICT space itself. Whereas when we are talking about open source itself, it is very limited to the software space. So that's one thing. And second thing is, even when we are talking of open source software, there's not a single definition or a model of open source licensing. There are multiple of them, and they do coexist. So this is something which I just want to add. Yeah, I'm Deepak. Yeah, um, uh, I think I'd like to respond firstly to the <laughs> 
Yeah, to the statement from the person from, what is it, Internet, Internet Bill of Rights. So you said, you know, why is this important for government? So I'd like to give you this example. This is the um, Independent Elections Commission of South Africa. So this is the body that runs our elections in South Africa. Right? This is where I go to find out if I'm registered as a voter in South Africa. This is where I go to find out where uh, I need to go to register. This is where I go to find out uh, the latest election results. This organization runs our elections. They're fundamental to the democracy of our country. They've gone out and bought a system that can only be accessed through proprietary software. Now. You know, the Bill of Rights and government procurement decisions, I think, are fundamental to internet governance. So I think I disagree with you to say you don't see the link. I see, you know, very physical uh, evidence of the link there. So I think, you know, it's very important that we, as government, realize the impact of the procurement choices we make. And we start understanding that. Um, I think also uh, around open standards and the role of government, you know, a lot has been said about what is the role of government, but I think um, all of us should also realize that a lot of the standards development has been very, very supplier driven. So at the end of the day, we buy products and then realize um, that we actually locked into certain uh, standards and certain formats. And we realized as government, we woke up and found out that 98% of our documents, 98% of our systems, uh, all of a sudden, oh, without uh, us taking note of it, I locked into particular formats, and we have no uh, room to move. And I think there's a conscious understanding that we need to be more proactive. We need to be, be involved in this process, and so that we don't find ourselves in the same, same situation that we buy applications and then, by default, find ourselves locked into particular formats. Um, around uh, Microsoft. Um, adopting the ODF standard. I think that's a great uh, move, and I'm hoping that more uh, organizations uh, move to accepting and adopting and supporting open document formats. But what I'd really like to see, and I think you're wrong in saying that it's the default. It's not the default, and I'd like to see it be the default. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a promise. And yeah, it doesn't exist yet. So you know, it, it, it's it's saying they will support it, and um, what I'm really looking forward to say is uh, to see is what does what do they actually mean by support? Uh, so I encourage the statement, but I'd like to see the evidence. Well, well, I think uh, we really un uh, underestimate the cultural problem. Uh, in Brazil, what we, we saw is that this major, the pol this major arrangements, that politics and, and things like that, it's easier than to change what, what someone wants to do. If the regular people, they want to send a mail and write a text, and then they are not very, very uh, worried about what what software they are using. And then what what was done there, it was uh, several meetings and uh, with the technical people uh, and so on to, to explain, explain to them as, wh what, as what we are doing here. It's, it's important because of these aspects, of, because of those aspects, and then people say, well, I, I can try. And then when, and the other way is that when you change the software. Regular people, they change very easy. All right, th then I can use this. I can send my mail, I can ri I write this text, then I, I, can, I can go on. This, this can you know, go on. I, can, I, I, I feel comfortable with, with that. It's easier than with the technical people because they, want, they, want, they don't want to change. They are used to that. They, are not, not, uh, they, ha they didn't have the, the training to, to, to change. Then it's, but then uh, when they get involved, they will really get involved. And then regular people, they say, yes, I, I don't want to change. But if you, if you ask me to, all right, I can, hand, I can do it. I can try. And then they, they, they and then try, it's easy. Then, then we have uh, uh, several uh, strategies to, to sensibilize 
something like that, to make them, them feel that this is important, that this, this, is, this is not that hard. To change is not that hard. All right. Thank you, Denise. Uh, for sure. Well, I think uh, we're drawing to a close now, and uh, we're. we're um, thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming to this open workshop. And just to let you know, um, DCAUSE is having another event on Saturday on uh, reforming the ICT standardization process. Um, I forgot the exact time and the room location, but it's on the event schedule that all of you should have. Thank you.